process of settlement is a civilization jihadist process. The Muslim Brotherhood must understand that their work in America is a kind of grand jihad in eliminating and destroying the Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands so that it is eliminated and Allah's religion is made victorious over all other religions. Without this level of understanding, we are not up to this challenge and have not prepared ourselves for jihad yet. The success of the movement in America in establishing an observant Islamic base with power and effectiveness will be the best support and aid to the Global Movement Project. Two months after 9-11, at the request of the White House, Swiss authorities raided the home and offices of a longtime Muslim Brotherhood envoy and international terrorism financier, Yosef Nada. One of the files that law enforcement officials seized, dated December 1st, 1982, was written in Arabic. It would become known as The Project, a detailed plan for Muslims to infiltrate and defeat the West, an incursion that would compromise leaders and law enforcement, control speech, and change the fabric of America. It would be slow, methodical, and permanent. Columbus is a standard Midwestern town, college town. We have the Ohio State University and a number of other schools. We have insurance industry, um, and, and it seems to be a pretty standard kind of town. Less than two miles from iconic Ohio Stadium is Riverview Drive in the Masjid Omar Mosque, home of the largest known Al-Qaeda terror cell since 9-11. In August 2007, three men who attended the mosque, Christopher Paul, Ayman Ferris, and Nuruddin Abdi, met at this coffee shop in Upper Arlington, Ohio. They planned to unleash domestic terror, first by bombing a suburban mall. It's not clear which, if any, of the six major shopping malls around Columbus the alleged terrorist wanted to blow up, and far from certain whether he had the actual wherewithal to do it. But federal investigators say Somali native and alleged Al-Qaeda operative Nuruddin Abdi has bragged to them that that was his goal. Abdi was arrested on November 28, 2003, and charged with conspiracy to provide material support to Al-Qaeda and two counts of fraud. He is a truck driver from Ohio, born in Kashmir, and a U.S. citizen since 1999. But federal authorities say Ayman Ferris is something more, an Al-Qaeda operative. Ferris was convicted of providing material support to Al-Qaeda for his role in a plot to destroy the Brooklyn Bridge. TV has learned Christopher Paul, a Worthington man accused of plotting to help Al-Qaeda, will plead guilty to working with terrorists. Christopher Paul grew up in the northwest suburbs of Columbus. He was a star athlete at Worthington High School, where he graduated in 1983. He attended Ohio State, where it's believed he converted to Islam. At some point during his life, Paul committed to violent jihad. He received his training at an Al-Qaeda training facility in Afghanistan. In June 2008, Paul pleaded to conspiracy to use weapons of mass destruction in a plot to attack a French island resort. Abdulakim Mujahid Mohammed also attended the Masjid Omar Mosque. In June 2009, he opened fire on soldiers in front of a United States military recruiting office in Little Rock, Arkansas, in a jihad attack. In a January 2010 letter to Judge Herbert Wright, Jr., he wrote, I'm affiliated with Al-Qaeda. 
This was a jihadi attack on infidel forces that didn't go as planned. The Department of Justice refused to try the case in federal court as a domestic terror attack. Mohammed was tried for murder by the state of Arkansas, and there was no investigation into his radicalization or training. Four individuals with ties to the mosque on Riverview Drive linked to terrorism. Patrick Poole began investigating. And so I'm driving down the road here, and of course this is an area I'm pretty familiar with since you know, I went to high school right there. And uh, I drive by here, Sunrise Academy, the full-time Islamic school. And I'm like, that's unusual. Uh, you know, that used to be the public library building. And that's when I went home and looked him up on the internet and saw that uh, Saul Sultan was their religious director. Patrick Poole lives in central Ohio. He discovered that the road to domestic terror went through his neighborhood. And of course, when I started looking into Salah Sultan, one of the things I did was uh, his address was on his resume. And um, so I looked it up and lo and behold, right here is where he lived. Um, not more than a mile from my house. Dr. Salah Sultan was the religious director at the Masjid Omar Mosque. He later moved to the Noor Islamic Cultural Center in Hilliard, Ohio. Poole wrote an article about Sultan, referencing previously published materials, demonstrating his connections to terrorist organizations. The interfaith community rallied around Sultan, as did the local newspaper. So the dispatch um, had their religion reporter come out and, and interview me and the article rolls out about a month after my report and you know here I'm a, you know a uh, racist bigot you know Islamophobe trying to impose Christian theocracy all, all for the for daring to question this guy what what had already been reported about this uh, gentleman here in Hilliard the Muslim Brotherhood has invented a term, and they've been very effective with this, called Islamophobia. And essentially, anybody who tries to address Islamist ideology, no matter how hostile it is objectively to the West, uh, is deemed to be uh, speaking hatefully about Islam, uh, and therefore to be a bigot and an Islamophobe. And in American culture, that's the worst thing you can be, right, is a, is a bigot. It doesn't matter whether you really are one or not. Uh, what matters is whether you'll be accused of being one. And that really is the template that the, that the media followed. While Sultan was being labeled as a respected religious leader, there was plenty of evidence to suggest he was anything but a moderate. Posted on Sultan's personal website was his resume. Vision, his vision, which I guess is his hope for the future, is to live happily and die as a martyr. Uh, for, for those of us, I don't think you have to be somebody who's actually uh, either prosecuted or investigated terrorism cases to know that martyrdom uh, is the way that in Islamist thought they refer to people who die in the jihad, that is, the, who die in, in violent activity, whether it's against the United States or Israel or uh, another target that's uh, achieved as an enemy or viewed as an enemy. Um, so I, you know, I think that that's a. Uh, th this looks like a resume that's certainly suggestive of, of somebody who is steeped in Islamist ideology, and you know, as somebody who's studied Islamist ideology and knows that it's hostile to the West, it would, it would, I'd find this alarming. Two weeks after the Columbus Dispatch writes their defense of Dr. Salah Sultan, uh, he shows up on uh, Middle Eastern TV where he's claiming that the United States government was behind 9-11. And then he goes on to defend a, uh, a, an al-Qaeda cleric, a close friend of bin Laden, Abu Majid al-Zindani, and um, there, there was never any follow-up report with the Columbus Dispatch. The United States Treasury Department has labeled Sheikh Zandani as a specially designated global terrorist. 
Sultan had his application for U.S. citizenship suspended and fled the U.S. in 2007. So fast forward to 2012, where is he today? Well, he's leading Muslim Brotherhood rallies in Cairo. He's meeting with the top Hamas leaders. And, um, you know, he's a senior advisor to the new Muslim Brotherhood president of Egypt. With Sultan as a top advisor, President Mohamed Morsi has fast-tracked an Islamist agenda, monopolizing power on behalf of the Muslim Brotherhood. Another former leader at the Masjid Omar Mosque on Riverview Drive is now the head of the Noor Islamic Cultural Center, Dr. Hani Safi. He has been listed as the founder, spiritual leader, administrator, and chairman of the Noor Center. He's a former professor at Ohio State University and currently teaches at Columbus State Community College. He was even the featured speaker at a 9-11 memorial service in 2011. When those people attacked the Twin Tower, they did not hear only destroy this, they destroyed the image of Islam. You know, this is the first responders park that they opened uh, the last September 11th anniversary that featured Hanny Soccer as one of the speakers. So, of course, the irony being that, uh, you know, you had this imam who was head of the mosque that had the al-Qaeda cell, and he's leading the, uh, you know, interfaith service um, <laughs> at the park, honoring the first responders. I mean, the, it's just rich with irony. The Noor Center, under Dr. Sacher's leadership, has hosted soldiers prior to their deployment to the Middle East. Today, the Muslim headscarf is part of her military uniform. The headscarf is just respect for the, um, the center here, um, for the women that are here, um, and, you know, just to be respectful to the people who come into their place being respectful. Campbell and about 40 other members of the U.S. Army Reserves sat down with members of the Noor Islamic Cultural Center to learn more about Islam and cultures in Muslim countries. In central Ohio, Hani Sakar is known as an interfaith moderate. However, during the Holy Land Foundation trial, the largest terrorism finance trial in U.S. history, the Justice Department entered into evidence documents showing Sakar was one of the top leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood movement in North America. Specifically, he was a member of the board of directors and on the executive committee. We don't want to inquire into their ideology because everybody is afraid of drawing the obvious conclusion that there's a nexus between Islamic scripture and Islamic doctrine and acts of terrorism. And nobody wants to be seen as somebody who is condemning an entire religion, which is what the Muslim Brotherhood frames it as if you draw that common sense connection, which, by the way, is something that the Islamists themselves draw when they're justifying acts of terrorism. Seven generations of my family have lived here in Hilliard. A lot of changes, but I doubt anybody would have ever have expected that, you know, this little cow town would end up being a, you know, hub of Islamic extremism, a hub of anything for that matter. The thing to remember is this is not something that's isolated to Columbus, Ohio. This is happening everywhere, whether it's Murfreesboro, Tennessee, or Temecula, California, or uh, Chicago, Illinois, or Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, this is occurring everywhere we look. And as has happened in Columbus, many who question the Muslim Brotherhood narrative are quickly branded as Islamophobic and racist. And it was only after the neighbors created opposition and brought in, you know, some of their, you know, anti-Muslim hatred into this picture that the city took a step back. Salam al Mariati is the president of the Los Angeles-based Muslim Public Affairs Council. We are seeing more evidence of anti-Muslim bigotry and, and Islam bashing. Uh, to so me, it seems like she is the extremist at this point. She's the one going around the United States lobbying against Islamic centers throughout all of the United States. It's not just the ones in Murfreesboro.
Now is the moment when we can do something. And with your help, we will do something. Attention, patriots who oppose Barack Obama. Obama would be president of the United States for four more years if the election were held tomorrow. Here's why. Obama gained 5% in the polls since the Democratic National Convention, and it gets worse. With the cash being funneled in from big labor and Hollywood, Barack Obama and Joe Biden have outraised us in August. With less than 50 days until the election, we must ask you and 20 million patriots to call right now and sign the largest voice pledge in history. We can still turn back the tide of socialism that's been taking over our country for the past four years. Call 1-800-414-5504 right now to affix your name to the official pledge to elect Mitt Romney. For signing your pledge in the next five minutes, we'll send you a free Romney bumper sticker as a way of saying thank you. So please call 1-800-414-5504 to sign the official pledge to elect Mitt Romney today. One of the things that we forget or, or we don't do enough of is to understand September the 11th in the context of 20th century history. It's not about the last 10 years, it's not about the last 20 years, it's about the last century. It's about the fact that less than 100 years ago, the caliphate still existed. We think words like the caliphate are funny, are quaint. What, a religious empire of Islam? You're joking, right? I mean, that was prehistory. No, that existed in 19. 14. Now, we didn't call it the Caliphate, it was called the Ottoman Empire, but for Muslims it was the Caliphate. It was the religious empire of Islam that had existed for centuries. The Organization of Islamic Cooperation, which used to be the Organization of the uh, Islamic Conference, is the Caliphate in the making. It's basically 56 Islamic sovereign governments and the Palestinian Authority. Their goal of the implementation of Sharia, um, the goal of Al-Qaeda, the implementation of Sharia, the establishment of the Caliphate, and the Muslim Brotherhood and Tabliki Jamaat and Jamaat Islami and the other parallel movements like the Brotherhood, nobody's ever put those together. That, that Turkey and Egypt and Pakistan are all parties to an organization whose stated doctrine is the same as Al-Qaeda and the Muslim Brotherhood and these other groups. That's important, and that's something Americans need to know. Now, they're basically positioning themselves as the proto-caliphate, and they've said that. They go all the way back to 1988, they play with the language so they can say, we didn't say that, but they kind of run right up to it and walk away. They make all these gestures to make it clear that, that we are that, but they do call themselves the Ummah. When the OIC meets, it's the Ummah, the Muslim community. And if you think about it, if they really do represent the Muslim world at the head of state level, that is the Ummah. And if they actually do make laws at the head of state level for the entire Muslim world, that would be the replacement of the Caliphate. The State Department's relationship, and of course, uh, Secretary Clinton as the head of the State Department, the Secretary of State, is that she has ongoing relations. Uh, we have a person who sits in at the OIC. Hello, my name is Rashad Hussain and I'm the present special envoy to the organization of the Islamic Conference. I would think it would be much better if at a senior level of the U.S. government we're meeting with the OIC, we're also meeting with some large group of non-Islamist, non-superiority, non-dominating Muslims, uh, such as uh, those in Indonesia. I think as a general proposition, the U.S. government ought to have relations with countries, not with religions. In 2005, the OIC held a summit in Saudi Arabia. The group developed a 10-year strategic action plan, which included a directive to combat defamation of Islam. The term Islamophobia is the politically correct term they created under which it rests the defamation of Islam concept which they plan to run through the United Nations. It makes no apologies about that. There, it's, it's quite straightforward. And the most frightening thing about it for Americans in the short term is that the biggest project the OIC has in the West, and particularly in the United States, 
is to restrict First Amendment rights. They basically want to make it a crime to discuss Islam in anything that they would perceive as a negative fashion. In 2011, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton attended a summit in Turkey where she met with the head of the OIC, who was garnering support for United Nations Resolution 1618, the OIC's Defamation of Religion Statute. Now, that Defamation of Religion Statute is a direct assault on the First Amendment. It's a direct assault on the First Amendment. And what did Secretary Clinton say? She committed in a foreign country to a foreign power, to a foreign entity, uh, the head of the OIC, that she would use old-fashioned techniques of peer pressure and shaming to go after anybody who would try to stand up against that. And I want to applaud the organization of the Islamic Conference for its leadership in securing the recent resolution by the United Nations Human Rights Council that takes a strong stand against discrimination and violence based upon religion or belief. I mean, these, these are the words of the apologists. And that's not what public officials should be telling the American people. The American people need to know what's going on. And what the State Department is basically agreeing to uh, is to have restri restrictions on speech that would incite what they would call hostility to Islam. Now, the only incitement you're allowed to prosecute under American law is incitement to violence. U.S. Ambassador Eileen Chamberlain Donahoe spoke to the UN Human Rights Council in March of 2011, supporting the resolution. We have long shared the concerns of the co-sponsors and others about intolerance, discrimination, and violence directed against persons on the basis of their religion or belief. The Brotherhood says to Al-Qaeda and the Salafi movement, look, we can do this through legal means, guys. Elections, they're doing it in the Middle East and North Africa, right? They're winning elections throughout the region. The Brotherhood's doing it through completely legal means in most cases. They're winning elections. They're getting jobs in the media, in academia. They're infiltrating. In September 2011, an article appeared on Wired.com that touched off a debate on political correctness and law enforcement. It became known as The Purge. The article was written by Spencer Ackerman, a man known for his connection to the Journalist, a private online forum that was used by liberal members of the media to promote a left-leaning narrative. It's very deeply upsetting to counterterrorism uh, experts inside the FBI. They're very concerned about two related issues, which are counterterrorism and civil rights. And those two go hand in hand, because uh, as you remember uh, the great uh, Jimmy McNulty said on The Wire, uh, a cop isn't anything without his sources of information. The um, track of the story arriving in Wired magazine, always Wired magazine, does send up a red flag in terms of being a conduit for a message. And the, whether the journalist in question is aware of being a conduit for a message or actually thinks that he is performing great journalism, I cannot say. But it has become a habitual track for this same kind of story. The, the, um, the sourcing has to be coming from the care side of the world and it does end up on the internet in Wired and plays out from there. By mid-October, the Deputy National Security Advisor, John Brennan, received a letter signed by more than 50 American Islamic organizations, some of which have been labeled as terrorist financing organizations by the United States government. Of the 13 footnotes, 12 were referenced to Ackerman in the letter to Brennan. Stephen Coughlin was specifically named for a 2011 presentation to the FBI field office in Washington, D.C., where he claimed that Islamic law was incompatible with the U.S. Constitution. And I'm in it because I think that the goal is to silence all discussion. 
because because we can prove that what we're saying is true as a matter of fact and we can say that it's true as a matter of Muslim Brotherhood's published doctrine or Al-Qaeda's published doctrine and it's proved it, it, it is true as a matter of published Islamic law. When that was brought to their attention that this information that's derogatory about Muslims or Islam came up, nobody looked at the facts. They just said, shut it down. It's regrettable that that information was, in fact, a part of a training program. Um, that person is not being used anymore um, by the FBI. Uh, and we are reviewing all of the materials, all of our training materials, to ensure that that kind of misinformation um, is not being used. Because that can really undermine, can really undermine um, the really substantial outreach efforts that we have made. On February 8, 2012, FBI Director Robert Mueller met with representatives from six American Muslim organizations, at least one of which had been named an unindicted co-conspirator in the Holy Land Foundation trial. Within just a very few days, the FBI Director was sitting down and meeting with some of these groups who were demanding the purge of the FBI documents, and they were also demanding an apology from the FBI director that they were even teaching materials that taught the FBI agents about Islam and the methods and the, the motivations behind Islam. It's really an incredible story that you'd, have, uh, that you'd have them calling on our FBI agents to not even know the basis and motivations for why terrorists do what they do. The Muslim Brotherhood depends on the silencing of our senior leadership and they're silencing their subordinates for their doctrine to work. As a matter of fact, it was made evidence in a court of law where they said they were gonna get our senior leaders to silence people under them, civilization jihad through our hands. That's what they mean by it. According to a February 14th, 2012 press release issued by the Islamic Society of North America, ISNA, more than 700 FBI documents and 300 presentations were deemed unusable by, quote, subject matter experts because they were considered offensive to the Muslim community. I received an email from within uh, the FBI which had been anonymized. So the people who actually asked me, invite me, sent me an email which had the name removed, the email removed, that they had received from somebody in government uh, which said, which listed which slides were deemed inflammatory and which had to be removed. And then I said, okay, um, I'd like to debate this. I'd like to talk to the person who's requesting these things. Could you find out who that person is? After many weeks of trying, the FBI managerial individuals who had invited me could not find out. So the FBI was denied knowledge of who in U.S. government was telling them what can and cannot be said in law enforcement training. And to this day, they don't know. Members of Congress asked for the names of the subject matter experts. We know there are three subject matter experts that uh, your office has refused to identify who have gone through and purged these materials. That information was then quickly classified. We finally, in a classified setting, which I don't really understand, but uh, we had the five SMEs revealed to us, subject matter experts. Perhaps um, they're afraid that people will be more concerned about the purged documents than otherwise once they know who, who the five SMEs are. As a matter of fact, when those training programs were reviewed, the agents that were teaching them were told, your information is not factual and it's hateful. And the agent said, you show us one sentence in here that's not factual. And of course, people at headquarters couldn't do that. But the purge that was being demanded by over 40 Muslim groups is saying we, we not only want training materials purged, we want trainers purged, the people who are teaching the materials. We want libraries purged. This is shocking because Nazis purge libraries, fascists purge libraries. In America, we don't purge libraries. We don't censor. How do we talk about the Muslim Brotherhood if we're not allowed to talk about the fact that they're specific, they exist, by their own words as a Salafi entity to bring Islamic law to the whole world and in the United States by subverting our government. How do we do that? And the answer is you can't. And so as long as that's the standard, this war's lost. 
I think they're not only winning the information war, they're going to win the entire war if we don't get off the mark and start actually engaging them where they're engaging us. Literally uh, three days ago, I was talking to a federal law enforcement agent who told me he was preparing a briefing, and it wasn't even a training briefing. It was a, a, you know, a normal briefing for internal use. And he had a photograph of one of the senior members of Al-Qaeda who were still hunting on the slide. And because there was an element of traditional Muslim dress worn by that individual, that Al-Qaeda bad guy, in the photograph, he was instructed by his management to remove that photograph from the presentation because it could be deemed offensive. This is, I mean, at some point, it's no longer laughable and it affects the safety of all Americans. In March 2012, the watchdog group Judicial Watch filed a Freedom of Information Act request, or FOIA, with the FBI and Department of Justice seeking access to records detailing the February 2012 meeting between FBI Director Mueller and U.S. Muslim organizations and the subsequent purge. The Department of Justice failed to respond to the request, and in July, Judicial Watch filed a lawsuit in federal court asking the information be made public. The Department of Justice has since filed a motion asking the request be dismissed. In a statement, Judicial Watch President Tom Fitton said, The FBI's purge of so-called offensive material is political correctness run amok, and it puts the nation at risk. The Obama administration owes the American people a full accounting of how and why this terrible decision was made. A key figure in the controversial FBI purge was the president of ISNA, Mohammed Majid. Majid had spoken at the CIA at a counter-terrorism event. He's worked with the National Security Council, and he sits on the Department of Homeland Security Advisory Committee. It doesn't get any better than showing, as a matter of public record, who it was that was helping our DHS, Civil Rights Civil Liberties Division, form its um, combating violent extremism narrative, a narrative to be enforced against the American citizens, heavy with Muslim brothers, led by Imam Majid, head of ISNA, unindicted co-conspirator. And instead of prosecuting them, we have an administration that has thrown their door wide open to them so that the president of ISNA, Imam Majid, uh, we, we find out from the White House's own uh, transcript of speeches that, um, well, he was leading the White House in iftar celebration at the end of Ramadan, doing the prayer for the White House. The president of a named co-conspirator organization supporting terrorism. By Majid's family ties alone, he should not be allowed in the White House without a stringent security clearance. Yet at the 2011 Ramadan iftar dinner that President Obama had at the White House, who was sitting front and center? Front and center at the head table, right in front of the podium where President Obama was speaking? Well, none other than Mohammed Majid. But once we as a, a nation understand that that's how embedded they are in our society, you can liken what they're doing to an insurgency, and therefore what, what we have to do can be likened to a counterinsurgency, and in a counterinsurgency, the focus has to be the local level. It has to be citizens working with their local city, town councils to get them educated, working with law enforcement to identify and weed these guys out of the community. It's the only way it's gonna happen. I sit on the Intelligence Committee. We're a very tiny committee. There are 19 of us, and we deal with the nation's classified secrets. And something that has been abundantly clear under the Obama administration is that there has been influence from the Muslim Brotherhood at the highest levels of power. That's a violent organization from um, across the world. And so we're raising questions. And if we get enough people to say, yes, yeah, something is wrong about our inability to talk uh, truth to power and 
to be honest about who the threat is. If enough people use that common sense to exert pr pressure upon the leadership in Washington and elsewhere, and the media, for example, then we will see something change. Because otherwise, the only time it will change, and this is the sad truth, is when that dirty bomb explodes in Boston, when that LPG tanker is detonated as it pulls into LA Harbor. That's when we will suddenly be in a panic and have to reassess everything we do in terms of securing our country. And I don't want it to be the next catastrophic attack that makes us say, okay, guys, uh, back to square one, let's be honest about this. I'd like it that the average American says, something ain't right, we're in 11th year of this war, it would be nice to begin talking about it honestly and attacking the enemy's ideolo ideology and using information warfare. Will you raise your right hand and repeat after me? I, George Herbert Walker Bush, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. So help you God. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. President. Our oath to the Constitution takes precedence over everything. And we know that we are tasked with keeping the American people safe. That's part of my job on the Intelligence Committee as well, as well as people on the FBI and the people in the military. The Texas-based Holy Land Foundation was once the nation's largest Muslim charity. Federal authorities accused the group of giving more than $12 million to support the Palestinian terrorist group Hamas. Another thing here, Wendy, that was exposed in this trial was really the clandestine network of radical Islamists right here in the U.S. A lot of so-called mainstream American Muslim groups uh, are linked to the radical Muslim Brotherhood movement. I can't even begin to come up with an analogy. The only thing that comes to mind is Neville Chamberlain arriving back in the UK after the 1938 Munich Agreement was signed with Hitler and proudly waving it over his head. A simple Google search, if they have Google at the White House, will reveal the concrete Muslim Brotherhood ties of the men and women they are inviting into the halls of power, into the inner sanctum. It's all there. If you want to see it, it's all there. The history of the FBI, the history of the United States military is to stand up for the truth and to fight for the safety and protection of the American people. That is what the soldier does. That is what the FBI agent does. But what's very troubling right now is that there's a new net of political correctness that seems to be thrown over the agency. It's not impossible to find real moderate Muslims to work with as distinct from people who are in organizations that the United States government has branded as unindicted co-conspirators in funding terrorism. It is astounding, uh, not just to me, I think when I just talk to citizens, they don't understand how this is possible. Like, what is it that, that they're able to see as citizens that seems very easy to understand that a government official, a president, a secretary of a cabinet position is, cannot see. Perhaps exposing the real threat to the United States the most telling examples of how the government has been infiltrated are sealed from public sight. The evidence that would expose the Muslim Brotherhood's jihad on America is kept in 80 bankers boxes. The files are from the Holy Land Foundation trial. The Obama administration refuses to release them to Congress and to the American people. It's very odd to me, given that that information doesn't belong to the executive branch. The executive branch actually works for the public. It's our information. Uh, and if the right place for it now is so that the people's representatives can, can get a better understanding of what the threat to the United States is, 
I, I don't see any valid reason for holding it back. And certainly, I haven't heard any legally compelling, articulated reason for holding it back. I brought it up to uh, Director Mueller and to Attorney General Holder, requesting the documents for members of Congress to look at that were provided in discovery to the defendants in the Holy Land Foundation trial. And I've been given, you know, had these brick walls thrown up. Well, you know, it's, we may not be, be able to disclose that. They gave them to the terrorist supporters. The terrorists all have those discovery documents. Why can't members of Congress? When I hear an attorney general of the United States come before us and say, somewhat cavalierly, there is a political aspect to this office. It offends me beyond belief. Your job is justice, Mr. Attorney General. It's justice across the board. And that is what's been so troublesome around here. When we made a request a year ago here for the documents that your department has produced to people who were convicted of supporting terrorism, they're terrorists. And we wanted the documents you gave to the terrorists. We're a year later and we still don't have them. Why in the world would your department be more considerate of the terrorists than of the people who are members of Congress who can vote to just completely defund your department? It makes no sense. So I will ask again. And, and there is no room for a response that, well, it's an ongoing investigation. Well, some of these may be classified. I'm asking for the documents your department produced to the terrorist supporters convicted in the Holy Land Foundation trial. Can we get those documents, just the ones that you gave to the terrorist defendants? Journalists have tried to get those records. Members of Congress have tried to get those records. Members of the Intel Committee have tried to get those records, tried to get those Muslim Brotherhood documents released, but they won't release them. The Obama administration is clinging on to them for dear life. Why? Because if they release those records, my opinion is that the entire House of Cards will fall. The story here is that the only thing that stops people um, from, from doing harmful things to the country and that activates them to take the measures that need to be taken to protect the country is political pressure that really comes from the American people. And if it happens, we could see a lot of very favorable policy change. If it doesn't happen, if we all remain asleep and blind, um, we could have some dark days ahead. Um, when it comes to where we stand and whether they've won or not, I always say, and you know, now I have the right to kind of say it, um, having become an American, America is not where I live. America is it's not Washington, it's not New York, it's not LA. America is everything in between. It's that part of the country that is you know, der derisively called the flyover states. I'm always confident about this great nation because well, there's one thing that defines the people in those states, it's common sense. Sooner or later, the, you know, Joe Sixpack says, hang on, something's not right here.